It's time. It's episode 68, the ATM podcast. Myself, Martin Dublin. Mark Watson, international commentator in much demand on four Olympic Games. Now, or is it three? This year will be the fourth. We're talking about test cricket. Why is it still at its very best, amongst the very best sport you'll ever see? Tennis, why are they persisting with this stupid no-flag thing? The Super Smash doesn't have a, a, a day to finish a game after the rain delay during the final game. I want to talk about that and what it actually means for New Zealand cricket. Klopp is leaving the sevens in Perth and the Taylor Swift thing. Apologise to me! But let's kick it off with the Test cricket, Mark. Why do you love that form of the game so much? Because I just think the whole game, the history, the statistics, it's all wrapped up in Test cricket. Everything we talk about, when you talk about the greats of the game, it's Test cricket. You can't just have, like, in T20 cricket, one player or two players, you can take it away from you. You need to have seven or eight players on their day. Yep, you can still have that individual hero. But I just think it is always done in sessions, isn't it? Who won the session on day one? Who won the morning session? Who won the afternoon session? Um, Who won the third session? And there is just... Yeah, something incredibly compelling about it. I mean, England beating India, I think, was even more remarkable than the West Indies beating Australia. Um, But it needed to happen, didn't it? We needed the West Indies to be able to win. We need the West Indies to be strong again. We can't just have three test-playing nations and then the rest of us. And at the moment, let's be honest, it's Australia, England and India, and then there is this group of countries, and probably New Zealand's almost the best of the rest Yeah, yeah, in terms of showing some level of consistency. Um, but I've said this in the past, Martin. I mean, you look at cricket at the moment, you go, yeah, okay, T20 provides the entertainment, but there's no jeopardy. It doesn't really mean anything. There's no real sense of nationalism if you win a game or if you lose a game. A uh, one-day cricket's just in the wilderness at the moment. The problem with T20 cricket is there's so much of it now that too much of a good thing is no longer a good thing. And if the ICC or the BCCI, whoever runs the game these days, uh, you know, really need any more... Um, evidence of the importance of test cricket. We saw it over the weekend, and it's just so fundamentally important that that is where the emphasis goes, and it can't just all be about the cash grab because that's only that's only a short-term business model. The fact that the first four days of the test in Wellington between Australia and New Zealand is sold out, again, just demonstrates how important that format is to New Zealanders as well. And so sometimes you've just got to stand back, see the wood through the trees, get rid of the marketing guys and get rid of the quick cash grabs and actually say for the long-term vitality of the game, this is where the emphasis needs to be. I mean, no one remembers who scored the most one-day runs or who's taken the most one-day wickets. We all know the Shane Warnes, the Muralitherins, the Hadleys, you know, when he took his 400 test wickets. I mean, when we think about cricket in this country, we really just think about the great test moments, don't totally we? Totally true. And we, do, and we do reminisce to a degree, um, you know, one day cricket in the 1980s with the explosion of that. But let's be honest, that is no longer a reality and that, that's past its use by date. Look, and I think it's a, a beautiful segue into the super smash, which, you know, we just get bombarded with the promotion of this and told how I'm you know, how popular it is. Sure, the TV ratings, and, and, and I respect that if people are watching it on TV, no one's going to the ground. So, But I question New Zealand cricket seriously about this. You've got a Super Smash final at Eden Park. You've got no rest day in case it rains. So one team bats. The other team, top of the table, doesn't bat. They actually get the trophy. There was a beautiful fine day in Auckland yesterday. They could have continued the game. And the other thing, and I'm not picking on him, but this is more reflective of New Zealand cricket and where New Zealand rugby is at. But Martin Guptill, they do this big promotional thing about how Eden Park Outer Oval gets named up for him on the semi-final. He, and then he's not even there for the final because he's actually off catching a plane back to Dubai to play some ridiculous international league. I didn't even know it was going on T20 tournament. Look, mate, and I want to add to this. I saw a Super Rugby ad the other day for Super Rugby 2000, and this is all in the same department store, different floor. But in that ad, the fundamental difference about the competition then and now was, A, it was a great competition. You had a lot of even teams, and just about anybody could win it. But the biggest difference is it featured all the very best players in New Zealand in that ad. And I'm sitting here going, so Super Smash you got a guy that you name a stadium after who can't even be bothered hanging around to play the final and you let him go. New Zealand rugby, you've got a super competition starting. You can't advertise it now with your best players, even though you did have Artie Savir all over the advertising of it last year, because they're not here to play it. New Zealand cricket and New Zealand rugby, you've lost control of your own sports. 
And we talked last week too. We didn't about a couple of our top women cricketers as well. Yeah. Just being able to go and play off the well, women. The, well, the black ferns, want. the but, black but, ferns after the World Cup, all of them running off to play touch rugby sevens in the United States when they should have been here promoting their own domestic comps. But these two organisations and administrations, Mark, I don't know any other company or business in the world that would go right. These are our top accountants. These are our best HR people. These are our best computer brains. Actually, they can go off over there and work over there for six months, right? Nobody no, would do it, was, mate. No, but we saw after the back of the Women's Rugby World Cup, where was Ruby Tui to then kick on with the promotion and stuff and some of our marquee players and the, you know, knowing that you're going to have an opac Super Rugby about six months later and you want to really try and capitalise on the interest garnered from that World Cup. But I've said this every week, Martin, the only people that are benefiting in this current model these days are the players. It's all about me, 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 me. It's all just about the players and that Players Association is so strong. It's such a, a strong trade union backing them behind them. And these organisations are just gutless. Oh, we've got to get the balance right. We've got to put the players' interest. They've got to sort of set themselves up for the rest of their life. It's like, mate, these guys have set themselves up already for the rest of their lives. And let's be honest, without playing for the Black Caps or without playing for the All Blacks, they would have nothing in Nothing, anyway. zero. So do not, you know, do not bite the hand that feeds. But it comes back to administration and it's gutless. I mean, super rugby. I mean, you just look around. Who is there this year to watch? In all seriousness, all our best players are playing in Japan all on sabbaticals. I mean, I'm looking through it going, so who are the marquee? I wouldn't even have any idea, Martin, who the marquee players are available for. Well, there are, a bunch of all see, blacks, lost... there are a bunch of All Blacks who have lost consistently over the last five yep. years. They're our marquee players now. Guys, yep. that we have not been the best team in the world since the 2019 yep. semi-final. That's official. That's five years now. So you are promoting what effectively is a bunch of players who are also rans in world rugby right now. But also just going back to your Super Smash, I, I mean, I'll be honest, mate, I couldn't even tell you who was in the final for that. I just don't watch it, mate, because the only thing I'm really interested in these days is Test Cricket. I've got more interest in what's happening in India with England. I've got more, you know, I, I'll be honest, I didn't have a lot of interest in the West Indies Australia because the West Indies were so bad in that first test. And then, as you said, you've got, you play this entire season, talking it all up, the Super Smash, it's this weekend, get it live here on this, and then... As you say, come down to the most important fixture and there's no backup day. Oh, because we don't want to spend extra money having to put these guys up another night in accommodation, having to change airfares around. And you just sit there, don't you? I know, you, you just, 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 I know. You just, 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 just think, what kind of bozos run this? And... Apologise to me! All right, let's move on then. Jurgen Klopp is leaving Liverpool. Uh, what have you, have you lit some candles and you put a little shrine yeah. up in the house, have you? Oh, look, I know, I know. As a Manchester United fan, um, I'm loving it. You're probably happy about yes. it. But look, he's been brilliant for the Premier League. He's been arguably, I'd argue, the best manager in the world. I know people talk about Pep Guardiola, but I think Pep Guardiola's got an unlimited budget and has probably had a slightly unfair advantage. But he's wrapped his arm around the city of Liverpool, mate. He rejuvenated that club. He's endeared himself to the public and. In all seriousness, whether you're a Liverpool fan or not, if you're a football fan, you need those personalities in the game. And yet, look, and Lachlan will say it to you too, I was actually genuinely heartbroken when I heard it. Like, I was actually quite saddened. I was driving off to um, go swimming on Saturday morning quite early, and I just had the BBC World Service on, and I heard the headline. I was like, you are kidding me. <laughs> and I just... It, it, Mate, it was and, like when and, Sir Alex and, left, mate. I look exactly the same. I felt exactly the same. And he did the same. He, you know, like, he, but, he, but, he embraced Manchester because the first thing that he said when he got the job was, I want to knock them off their perch, right? So this is what Klopp yeah. understood football, understood what it means to the city of Liverpool. And look, I, I admire it. I just, you know, I mean, I, I, I just, as a Man United fan, resent it. That's all. Yeah, and, but that's what it's all about, isn't it? Guys like that also create their rivalry. They're part of the story. They're part of the narrative. You know, Klopp, the guy that, you know, was in charge of Liverpool when they beat Manchester United by seven. Mm. Uh, look, you know, we're, 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 still in, we're still in four competitions. You know, we still potentially could finish the season. Premier League champions, Europa Cup champions, FA Cup champions, and EFL, we could end up with none of them. But we're in the game, and that's what the clubs want. They want you to be competitive. They want you to be there, as I say, on the back nine of the final day of a major championship competing. And that's what he has done. And his ability to take good players and make them great yeah, players. Yeah, yes, true. His ability to identify players with a good work ethic and saying, I'd rather have this guy than the off-field personalities and dramas that go with this superstar. And it's been unique. Uh, look, I guess the only thing that gives me a little bit of hope now is I do hope they get Shabby Alonso because I was just talking to Lachlan off here and he was saying that, you know, Mourinho a few years ago even identified Alonso is potentially one player who he felt would be an outstanding manager and he's done some great things. And I think we need to look at youth. I think we need to look at a manager maybe in their early 40s, late 30s, 
somebody that's got a bit of vision. But I think he's just got a, such a strong connection to the club. You know, he won a Champions League trophy with them in 2005. And look, it's not ideal. Um, you also don't want to be that guy that sometimes comes in and replaces a great manager. Uh, like Moyes did at Manchester United, because you're often you're on a hiding to nothing. Sometimes you want to be that second manager that comes in after a great manager. Apologise to me! All right, a couple of topics to finish with. Tennis, and just how infantile is this no-flag thing? Now, when a Belarusian wins the Aussie Open and a Russian guy makes the final and you don't have the flags beside the name, you know, I was saying yesterday, Mark, that, you know, News Hub had the Ukrainian colours all over their masthead and that for a couple of months while it was du jour, and now I look at it and, oh, that's gone. So does that, what, is that war finished or is just your interest in it finished? And this is what I feel like world tennis has done here. You've been you know, trying to make a stand or making a point, which hasn't worked at all. And it just looks silly now, doesn't it? Oh, look, it does, mate. It's ridiculous. And it's like, you know, I mean, we, you, you can pick any country apart from their foreign policy. You know, how often do you have the Americans who feel that a country's a certain threat? So they go in and sort of say, hey, look, we'll sort them out. And then you get Putin who sits there and says, look, I think Ukraine's a threat to us. Now, I'm not certainly justifying it. So he goes and sorts it out. And suddenly he's this great war criminal because he's, you know, he doesn't sort of sit comfortably with Western values. And I mean, the whole thing is just complete and utter hypocrisy. You could pick it all apart. You can have a look at what's happening in Israel and Gaza. You God, you could even break it down to race relation issues within certain countries and where the Australians treat Aboriginals. I and mean, where do you take it all, mate? At the end of the day, most of these players don't necessarily agree with their governments. They're not necessarily in cahoots with them. They're just there to play tennis, mate. And they're actually proud of their country and the way they grow up and the history of it. Not everybody is politically aligned or has the same beliefs as some of these people. But also, you know, who's right and who's wrong? Well, that's pretty easy, isn't it? Because we always put a bit of a Western spin on things. And so, you know, and we don't always fully understand both sides of it. So, look, I just don't think there's a lot of room for politics in sport, mate. I never have believed in it. Let's just treat these people with respect. Let's treat these people with dignity. If they come from a country, put their damn flag up and let's move on. Apologise to me! Finally, the Taylor Swift thing. And now, I've been thinking about this overnight. And I'm, I'm one of those NFL fans who's now at the stage where the television directors, who are obviously run by the marketing and the PR departments, have just got to stop this nonsense. If every time anything happens on a field, they go to her in the box. Look, I mean, she's... I don't know who she is. I mean, I, I don't listen to her music. and But she's incredibly successful. She's a fantastic pop star. And she's got a boyfriend who plays the NFL. I'm sure that... You know, as much as she gleans publicity about every aspect in her life, that her private life and her private life with him is, is their business and she wishes that it wasn't splashed all over. Where do you, where does the line get drawn where all of a sudden... Look, I noticed even on the Stuff website yesterday, they ran a story not about the Super Bowl, about her giving her boyfriend a kiss on the field afterwards. It's a crossing of pop culture and sport culture and everything else, but it's got to the stage where it's tiresome. And I even wonder whether for them it's tiresome or, or are they just milking every single second out of it? Oh, I think they're actually milking every second second out of it. I think she goes out with an NFL player because I think, you know, if he was a plumber, she wouldn't look at him twice. That's just my opinion. Just going back to it, mate, you said you thought about it overnight. Did you have your clothes on or clothes off <laughs> when you were thinking about Taylor? Just, just, just checking, mate, because I've got to be perfectly honest. I've never, ever thought once about this relationship. Um, I'm with you, though, mate. I just want to watch the game. But then you do look at society, don't you? I keep saying this. Look at Love at First Sight and what's it called, Love Island and Married at First Sight and all this stuff, and look at the popularity. Yeah, they're incredible. You know, it's just junk food for the mind, but people seem to lap it up and love it. And I think there is now a real crossover, isn't there, between pop culture and sport and fashion and, you know, being seen in the right places. But it's like anything, too much of a good thing starts to become not a good thing and then starts to become an irritation. And I think Taylor Swift and um, what's her name? Travis Kelsey. Travis Travis Kelsey. Travis Kelsey, I, I think you've got to be careful that it doesn't become too set, you know, too much saturation, and that then turns to, you know, people just start to actually get a little bit annoyed, and and you you just sort of, um, you know, there's an oversaturation of it. But look, just just on that, I just changing completely. Isn't the tackling in the NFL just appalling? The tackling is dreadful in the NFL. I watched yesterday that Detroit Lions San Francisco 49ers game, and the way. The Lions just ripped through them in that first that first quarter and almost through that first half. And just tackling is a dreadful. The amount of money these players get paid. And then when they do make a tackle, they jump up and down and give each other a high five like they've just created the greatest thing in sport. It's like, man, they could learn an awful lot from rugby league and rugby union, um, you know, from the highest level of the game in this country in regards to the tackling side of the sport. 
Devlin. I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not gonna take this anymore! The Platform.